Fuji Sports. Listen, they've been working with us for a while now. Um, particularly, they've been supporting and sponsoring this show for over a year. And uh, they have some cool stuff going on, on their website, don't they? They always have cool stuff. Uh, amazing gear. Anything you would need for your jiu-jitsu journey, you can find at fujisports.com. But just scrolling through right now, uh, apparel, obviously, geese, bags, anything you could possibly ask for, you can find at fujisports.com. Hey, it's been a while since we started Roll TV Project. Uh, it's been a while since you started it. I did come in later, and um, I can't say enough about it, especially the new platform. It's really amazing, fully customizable, uh, and you know a little bit more about the structure. Well, so two things you need to know. One is the subscription service, which is 9 bucks a month. Um, you can get access to hundreds of videos, hundreds of drills, techniques, and so on in a very nice labor, library categorized as you need them. But two different lessons. Um, you can actually purchase those individually, and you own them, so the subscription is not tied to it at all. You can look at things like spider guard, half guard sweeps, half guard chokes, um, uh, folding pass, and so on. There are so many of them out there. So take a look um, and see where you need help with the videos, right? 30% if you type in Roll Radio as a code, who doesn't like saving money, go to RollAcademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please remember to hit the like, share, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. This ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you have come to expect. This week's guest has done it all in the world of jiu-jitsu and MMA. He is a former Pan American champion two-time Abu Dhabi silver medalist, veteran of Pride FC and the UFC, owner-instructor at RABJJ, and coach of multiple BJJ world champions and former UFC champion Frankie Edgar. Ricardo Almeida joins the Roll Radio to discuss the evolution of jiu-jitsu, growing up with Henzo Gracie, his professional fighting days, the role jiu-jitsu has played in his family, and a ton more. Here's the Roll Radio with one of the most influential and greatest coaches in BJJ and MMA and the first person promoted to black belt by Henzo Gracie, Ricardo Almeida. Welcome to Roll Radio. And we are live. Yes. Hey, you look cute. I do. Yeah, I know. I always do. I mean, that's kind of uh, redundant, isn't it? I, what are you we, trying? Because we have the same hoodie on? Well, here we go. If you're not watching this yeah. on YouTube, you should. You should. You we, can see who wore it better. And I know, I know you'll, this, you'll is getting, me. this is getting awkward. <laughs> right, not, right not for up. me. You know I like awkward. Oh I, I enjoy awkward. Yeah, yeah you, should, you do for sure. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's get to our guest right off the bat. Um, you know, it's it's been amazing, amazing several conversations up to this point today. It, I think it's going to be really exciting. Professor Ricardo Almeida in the house. How are you, sir? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you guys so much for having. Me. Thanks for joining us today. Um, you know, I, I think I think what's interesting about you and and what you've done for Jiu-Jitsu community is really building a very very successful academy. Um, from ground up, and I, I, I think that that I would like for to pick your brain today on on that topic particularly, or at least start with it. Um, there is a lot of desires um, from black belts, brown belts, or maybe even even lower to not only be an instructor but also to have a successful academy and make a living on it, and and um, providing the compensation for themselves and then have staff and grow it into something larger and bigger within community to impact impact um, you know the people who we surround ourselves with. Do you think building an academy is easy? I mean, nothing about jujitsu is easy, you know, but I think that, you know, there are some principles, like we've, we've been doing it long enough that there are some principles and and uh, sort of like best practices that if you adhere to, your chances of success, success are much higher, you know, like on as a student on the mats, as well as, a, as an instructor trying to start a school. And I really do believe there's a lot more people out there that need jujitsu, that people that are sort of, you know, qualified to teach. I'm not, it's not up to me to tell if someone's qualified or not, but you know, I think there's a lot more people that really need jujitsu 
then you know instructors who are out there teaching it in a way that's that's built for the recreational practitioner that needs it and, and uh, not necessarily just for the for the competitors you know and i think that's important actually to identify that not everybody will be a world champion not everybody will even compete right when we go back to 10 20 30 years ago a lot of the jiu-jitsu was focused on competition today is exposed to a little bit more Recreation, if you will, which is what you just mentioned, right? A, a you know, a, a somebody who has a professional career, somebody who has family, they still have this opportunity to engage into jujitsu as a hobby, as a sport, as a martial art. Absolutely, you know, I think that when I first got started, for sure, the the culture, you know, in Gracie Baja, first step on the mats, I think for sure the culture was very geared towards competition. And it wasn't necessarily something that Master Carlos, you know, made us do, you know, hey, you got to go compete, but it's just sort of like you walked in and and everyone is competing. So you just kind of sort of, in, you, you enter this conveyor belt of champions and you just sort of like, that's what we did at the time, you know, but over the, especially the past two and a half decades that I've been training uh, more than that, but uh, I've seen like the pool got so much bigger, right? Like I think a lot of the black belts, um, you know, aged and started families and, and because we get so much from jujitsu, and that's, that was my main motivator for trying to build an academy. It was like, all right, now I have kids, you know, I want my kids to be able to train in this environment. Like, and, and, and it wasn't an environment when, you know, when I was in the beginning where it was conducive to kids. I think that first school that I built we had like 300 students and not even a kids program, you know? So um, once we would add kids and add families and it's changed, I think for sure it's changed. And I think it's, uh, it's changed for the better. And now, you know, I have a chance to, you know, I've had a chance to train, you know, a couple of jiu-jitsu world champions, a couple of UFC champions. And, and for sure, I still have a chance to focus on the competitive side of jiu-jitsu, but impact a whole lot more people and that to me is very rewarding you know from from you know we were talking a little bit in the background before the the show got started from my son who's autistic who who needed jujitsu more than anybody and you know it's impacted his life in a way that i never thought it was possible even though he's never stepped on the mats to compete um in jujitsu and all the way up through you know UFC champion Frankie Edgar, who's been my student for, you know, 10 years, over 10 years, and black belt in jiu-jitsu, and it's a small part of what he does in, on the, in the octagon, but it's for sure had an impact on his life. Too. Yeah, and we'll talk about your, your son and, and, and how that was unfolded, the impact that jiu-jitsu made on him in a moment. I know that Gary wants to um, engage in that, but let's talk about a little bit more about this competition versus hobby um, environment. Is it possible to have those two groups in one academy or does academy has to focus on one or the other? It's not only possible. I think it's necessary, right? Like I think one pushes the other. I think everyone, you know, sort of like within a school needs to understand that, you know, it's, it's our guys that compete, that go out there and, 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 you know, they train at a much higher intensity. They, they compete at a, at a level that a lot of people that just train two, three days a week are not able to, and they go out there and compete against the best in the world. And, and they bring back all these, all these lesson learns, right? Like in these lessons learned, once they get proven over and over again, they sort of become best practices and, and, and these best practices sort of like, you know, push us forward with the technique. And we're always learning new techniques. And I'm always motivated by that, right? Like I'm, I'm super, um to this day i see guys coming up with new stuff and it's very exciting to me and it's typically my students i'm not you know i'm not in in the lab trying to come up with like a new guard leg lock entry or a new back take or new this but i'm always observing my students and uh, and i'm looking for the sort of um the discovery of these new best practices that we could introduce and become sort of something that everyone on the team could use right like whether it's the mma guys or the the you know hobbyists that would never really use it in a competition uh or perhaps even in a street fight but it's it, it sort of becomes a part of what we do at the academy and i think the 
that the competitor guys need to also understand that for the academy to survive, for them to have a chance to come in and train in a school with a couple hundred students that, you know, we need the recreational practitioners. And for someone to walk into a school with like 20 people, yeah, that's school. Maybe it's an up and coming school. But like, if you look at the, at the schools that have been able to produce world champions after world champions, you know, I'll, I, I could talk about Gracie Baja, but it's close to my heart and it will be biased and people will just kind of like turn their nose. Let's look at Alliance as an example, right? Like these guys have been producing world champions after world champions after world champions. They always, my competitors, and to a certain extent, I've always hated those guys, but I admire them so much, right? The job that, you know, Fabio Gurgel has done with Alliance is incredible. You know, the recruiting and development of talent there is unbelievable. And you know, it's because you've had these hundreds and hundreds of guys already go through the process and become champions, you know, and, and in a pool of probably like thousands of students around the world that, you know, a simple technique or a simple, it's not just the technique, but a simple way of teaching a technique. And especially when you go from fundamentals uh, into, you know, more advanced stuff is how do you get someone from this sort of like fundamental level? into point B, C, or D, where now they're not only have a variation of attacks and defense, but they're able to do it live in a world-class level. I think that bigger schools uh, have figured out ways to transfer that knowledge in a much more efficient way than perhaps like schools with less students. So I think for sure, when I look at that from a competitor side, if I'm getting started right now, and I want to be a world champion, I'll most likely seek to be in a room where there's been people that already been there, done that, versus try to be in a place where everyone's just kind of trying to figure out how to roll the boat, which direction to roll the boat, yeah. you know, if the boat is seaworthy. But that's just sort of my personal opinion, you know? No, I think it's human nature to surround yourself by people who are better than you and have experience in what you're trying to achieve. And I think it would be in a similar direction, too. If some there is a hobbyist that has no desire in competing, you know, they likely will be looking at, 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 at the academies as, oh, okay, am I going to get destroyed in this, on this mat? Am I going to get hurt on this mat because of the intensity that this training might be taking on? So I'm wondering... What is your train of thought or how do you have these conversations with students with one or the other group? Because a competitor could come in and say, listen, you guys have competitors, but this competitor class is not big enough for me. I'm not going to benefit here. Or it could go the other direction where, you know, a, a hobbyist comes in and say, I don't want to get smashed my face into the ground and get hurt and, and, and not be able to compete how do you differentiate those two groups from a training perspective? How do how these conversations unfold? Well, my perspective and my idea towards that, right? Because when I moved to the United States, uh, Master Hanzo, I came here to teach at Hanzo Gracie Academy. And, and you know, Master Hanzo had, he had nobody to train. He didn't have training partners. And instead of bringing people in from Brazil when he was getting ready for competitions, like he built, he built me, he built Matt Serra, he built Rodrigo Gracie at the time to sort of like be good enough to be his training partners or to be knowledgeable enough to teach in his absence when he didn't need to be around. Right. Like, so I've always, I've always had that in my mind. So that was the example that I had, right. Like, and sort of how I have applied that and observed that in real life, observed and then sort of like it's kind of I try to guide my guys I think that if it's ideal I think to start in a place where there's plenty of people who have done it where the there's already best practices in place where people know how to get someone let's say from white to blue belt safely right so that it's not law of the jungle that everyone just try to beat each other up and and you're getting heel hooked in the in the first six weeks of training you have no idea what's going on right like there is safe and that you've, you know, you've gotten, you know, a couple hundred people from white to blue belt or a couple thousand people, I don't know, from white to blue belt, right? But I think that eventually, uh, and, and, and that's the easy way to, to progress, right? Like you're, if, if you're less skilled, you train with someone more skilled, you develop yourself a lot faster. But I think eventually everyone becomes skilled enough so that that methodology of skill, skill acquiring is not good enough because you can't have a room always where you have 
10, 20 people that are way better than you, mm -hmm. right? Like, so when we all start training, our progress is very exponential. Like we improve so fast. And then I would just say, let's say a purple belt level, right? Like most purple belts, they walk into a jiu-jitsu school, unless you are at Atos or, 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 or Gracie Baja doing a road training camp or an alliance. Like if you're a purple belt and you walk into a jiu-jitsu class and you're a decent purple belt anywhere in the world, most of the times you're going to have maybe a couple of people that are better than you, mm -hmm. right? So then how do we get better, right? And the way to get better once you've become sort of like good enough so that you're just getting beat up is not making you better is you have to learn to make the people around you better, right? And let's just look at Hodger, like Hodger Gracie, probably the best competitor that we've ever seen in sport jiu-jitsu, ADCC and with the Gi. He was in England, man. He had no training partners. Like later on, Braulio Estima went there. But even so, like Hodger is so much bigger than Braulio. And how, how uh, Hodger progressed from when he was a brown belt, because I trained with him. He was coming here very often when he was a brown belt, how, how he was as a brown belt. And then what he became when he put that performance at ADCC that he submitted every match, like submitting all ADCC champions on the way to the final, including Jacare in the final. Like how he progressed was training with his blue belt students and maybe purple belt students at the time, you know, like, so how does someone do that? Right. And I think that has to be a part of the culture of, or, or, or eventually something clicks in the mind of the purple belt where you look around and you are like beginning to get to the top of the food chain in, in any given class. And your progress is no longer brought upon by just getting beat down. I think, of, of course, when you're getting ready for a big competition, like you need to like, you know, bring up the level of intensity, right? But on a day-to-day, -day, the progress of the typical purple belt in most jiu-jitsu classes is, will happen a lot with taking upon some leadership, perhaps a little bit of teaching. But even if you're not teaching uh, formally, that when you're rolling with someone, you're helping them out, like you're positioning yourself in a way so that, you know, they learn how to pass. And then you recover guard. Are you just playing jiu-jitsu a little bit? And then you turn up the level of intensity for competitions, right? Like, so I think having that ingrained in the student's head facilitates so much because eventually everyone gets too good so that, you know, just getting beat up or beating people up is not the way to go. It's really helping each other that we get better. Do you, do you think that what you're talking about right now, this purple belt who's beginning to shape in these leadership roles and helping others, do you think that's important for those individuals to eventually become a black belt and eventually, perhaps, taking on their leadership role with teaching or even having their own academy. Is that important? I think it is, man, you know, but we've, we're going through, like, another sort of, like, transformation, right? Like, I had a time where perhaps I didn't, I hadn't, like, graduated too many black belts, right? Like, I had a couple of guys here and there. And then I had, like, a few, like, five to ten years where pretty much almost all the guys that I graduated to black belt ended up opening their own schools, you know? And, like, I have a lot of guys here in, you know, I'm in New Jersey. So between New Jersey and New York and Philadelphia, you know, from, from Tom the Blast through, like, a couple of the black belts, like, all these guys open schools and their students have, you know, other black belt that, you know, probably nobody's ever heard of, but that's where Gordon Ryan started training, you know, like, so I had, like, all these black belts. And now in a period where, you know, I had like moms that turned into black belts and, and you know, guys who, who never have the time to dedicate to running a full time, full on academy that have gotten their black belts, like a, like real sort of like recreational practitioners. There are black belts and they are and they are, you know, like uh, they are badasses in their own right, you know, like within their own sort of limitation or you know, with the performance being the limitation, like they're really, really good, you know? Um, so yes, I think as many people as we can, we should try to encourage them to become, you know, real jiu-jitsu instructors full-time. But many, many schools that have a couple hundred students, they will eventually get to a phase where, you know, you have a lot of black belts who are not, you know, just the same way we have black belts that are not fighters, we have black belts that are not full-time instructors, you know, but for sure for me, if I had it my way, every one of my black belts would be instructors. Let me pick your break. Sorry, Gary. Well, I just wanted to ask, while we're talking about competition, can you be the best you can be without being a competitor? Can Just being like on the mats as many times a week as you can, but not competing, 
Do you think you can still be the best at jiu-jitsu that you could be? That's a very good question. Uh, I'm like, may have to pause a little bit to think about, right? Like I, I do think that there is a certain, there are certain things that you learn about yourself and about jujitsu in a competitive environment. That's very difficult to replicate, like without that sort of like trial by fire in a way. Um, I do think that, but then I have like a couple of guys that have never competed that or have competed like, very, very little. They have really, really incredible jiu-jitsu. Um, do I think that if they had competed, they would be better if their jiu-jitsu would actually be better? Yes. But to some people, competition like is not the way to go, right? Like they just don't necessarily identify with it. And so I have to say that for as good as they want to be, and in their choice of not competing, I think that you know, for that one specific person, you know, you don't necessarily need to compete to be as good as you're choosing to be. But I, if I have to, maybe it's, I'm a little old school about that. Like, I think that if they did compete a little bit, and you know, they really did put their skills to the test, whether they ever won anything or dominated in competition or not, I think that they would have gained something that you can't gain by just uh, training at the academy. So how I don't do know you, if that answers your question. It does. I think so. I think so, so how do yeah. you, so how do you, create these goals in your mind for the for these students right and what i mean by this if one competes and they win obviously their jiu-jitsu is good in that competition scenario there was a success that proves that right but we have another person who is you know average joe schmo this is their hobby they train two or three times a week there's no desire of competition how do you grade their jiu-jitsu, how do you know that they are a brown belt, that they are a black belt? You know, the, the lines are a little bit more blur here. Um, how do you process that in your mind? How do you know that Bobby Joe is a should be a black belt at this point? So, you know, I remember how Master Carlos used to describe that, Carlos Gracie Jr. He used to say that you can't expect like a Volkswagen Beetle to accelerate and race as fast as a Ferrari. Oh, well, right? I know. And that I mean, look could, at this guy right here. That yeah. could, like, in I'll a way, like, be, like, <laughs> taken out of context, um, you know, like, when you're comparing something to something else or someone to someone else. Um, I do think that when we start to run into, if performance is not necessarily the main the main sort of measuring stick, then what is the measuring stick, right? There's the little guy. Uh, I was gonna, yeah, back. it's somebody coming down the <laughs> stairs. That's great. <laughs> He's leaving for, uh, he runs track, so he has track practice. Um, so he, so what's the next thing that we look for when we, when we start to analyze? And I think the only sort of like tangible, well, you know, it's, we use our iometer, right? Like we will observe and you can, you can sort of tell, right? But I think the other one is time. It's time, you know, it's training age. Not necessarily belt, uh, but training age. And then, you know, provided that these people are training in a consistent way, I think that, you know, the training age, the time on the mats, I think is the, the second thing that I look for, you know. Like, man, I just have this thing that if you hang out around my school for 10 years and you come twice a week, you're going to be a black belt, you know. That's it. Some, some guys are going to be really good. Some guys are maybe not going to be as good, but that's on them. It's not on me, right? Like, I think it's... Um, you know, like everyone just sort of like gets to a certain level, right? I think that you know when you see a when you see someone at black belt, I think that you know they start to develop like leadership. They for sure have the 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 competency, right? Like and the and the confidence within their skill that you know that they're able to beat someone up by slowing themselves down versus matching someone's level of intensity, right? Like, that, I think that's when you start to see the level of experience. And then to be able to do that, you know, a purple belt with uh, a brown, you know, a brown belt that's about to get his black belt, you know, and get a black belt, they're able to do that to a purple belt. They're not just able to do that to a white belt, right? Like, I think that, you know, to, to a certain extent, we're always comparing and, and that's okay, right? Like, it's something we all need to push. Um, but I really look at, I look at time, like how long do you know, I really use the IBJJF sort of like guidelines, you know what I mean? Like what two years, you know, a year for 
white to blue, like two from blue to purple, year and a half, year and a half, about six years. But, you know, because sometimes people people's life happens and they're not on the mats as consistently, you know, it's like eight to 10 years, you're a black belt. And, and, and I believe in jiu-jitsu, man. Like if you're training and you've been training that amount of time and you've been, tra- been really like putting your time in, like, you know, within eight to 10 years, you should be able to have the sort of skill that, that we all know what it looks like when someone is actually going slower and they're still beating someone and they're just like flopping around like a, like a fish out of water and they're still beating them. Right. Like, so when you see that, it's like, all right, that's, there is a, there is a mastery there in, in, in the, in the technique. And there is a, there's a confidence in the skill that to me is black belt. Like, and you know, to me, that's a symbol of mastery. And so what I look for is more, more or less, that, you know? Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree. I mean, if you if you do anything for ten years and you put significant amount of effort and time into it, you know, you become a, a, an expert in some capacity. You know, you you might not necessarily be a world champion, but it gives you a certain sense of experience. I mean, ten years—that's a freaking long time. I mean, let, let's just be honest about this, right? So, do you think anybody can become a black belt? I mean, I know this is a wishy-washy question, like controversial even in jiu-jitsu, you know. Is jiu-jitsu for everybody, you know? But do you think that everybody has the opportunity to become a black belt or most don't, actually? I think so, man. I think that, you know, um, most of the limitations that I think people will run into on their way to black belt, if they have committed to becoming and they're not able to do it, will either be life happening right? Or most of them will be like more mental than physical, right? Like whether someone has a big enough ego that they are sort of like not able to go through some of these transformations that would happen to us on the mats, or, you know, sometimes someone has a really negative and traumatic experience, whether it's in life or on the mats that just sort of like pulls them away from, from jujitsu, you know, like sometimes people are not able to overcome that. Uh, and we need to be weary and, 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 and observe, like, you know, the interactions as they're happening on the mat. Like, someone, sometimes people, no matter how, how aggressive they may seem on the mats, they're not ready for the beatdown that, you know, most of the times we are so quick to dish to them. Um, and, and probably, like, as I was younger, I was a little bit more quick to dish those beatdowns. And I'll never shy away from those beatdowns when I deem them necessary. But I've become a lot. I've become. I've become a lot more patient. You know. I, I feel like uh, there's a story or two surrounding that statement. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, I think that I do believe anyone can can become a black belt. You know, like my my little guy that just walked out the door. He. He is not a black belt. Uh, you know, he hasn't trained in, since high school, since, you know, he started running because it takes so much of his time. But I do believe that if he had dedicated his time, he would be a black belt. You know, he'd probably never win a match at a tournament. Uh, you know, he really sometimes, like, struggles with the live training, but, you know, he loves jiu-jitsu. Like, oh, you know, we've had some really, really great times on the mats, you know, and and and, and now he's a, he's going to be a, be a college runner, like, yeah. Uh, scholarship to go run um division two in college so wow. Wow. you know it's, it's a choice that he made that pulled him away from the mats but i do believe that he'll be a black belt for sure well good for him first of all congratulations that is not a small small achievement right there so uh it's going to be amazing to watch that um you talked about transformations different transformations as we go through this journey do you remember or you know maybe i should ask what was the biggest transformation for you do you, what was the one pivot point in your jiu-jitsu path journey that really made a tremendous impact um, on who you are today? So, so I started training jiu-jitsu, right, when I was 15 years old. So as I sort of, like, mature and became a young man, I was sort of, like, becoming a black belt at the same time. So that's sort of, like... Uh, maturation right like and 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 how i started to see the world and then you know i moved here to the united states as a brown belt and started to you know started to be able to travel the world with jiu-jitsu whether it was adccs or going to japan for the pride fights with henzo right like I, I started to see the world and once you get exposed to all these different experiences you grow right then you start to see things in a different way than perhaps before you've seen those things right um so it's hard for me to to separate 
like what was growing up and what was becoming a black belt. Like to, for me, they both happened at the same time. Okay. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, as far as becoming an instructor and a school owner, like, my school didn't really take off until I became a father. And I knew I wanted to create an environment that my kids could train in one day. Right. Like, so to me, that was very impactful. Something from, from off the mats that, you know, influenced me as a, as a person, as an instructor on the mats, very, very, very strongly. Right. But if I had to think about, um, like a transformation that had, that happened on the mats, I think for sure, you know, moving to the United States and, and living at Hanzo's house and spending so much time with Hanzo and, 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 you know, hearing sort of like stories about the Gracie family and just really like being around Hanzo, I, it made a very strong, um, a strong impression on me, you know, on, on, you know, the sort of the, not the responsibility, but the pride, like the pride on, on, on being, you know, an instructor, the, you know, the, the sort of like uh, self-belief and, and the courage and the training, like, and all the things that you need to have to do those things well, right? Like, and then, and then once you feel like you're doing them, you know, well, to a certain extent, like the pride and, and, and being able to share that with other people, but also the responsibility, you know, like that was, that was something that has always put on us, you know, like, you know, cool, we could compete, but, you know, can you teach and, and can you, can you be nice to people? Like, can you treat people, you know, with the, with the respect and show them a good time and, and, and treat people equally, right? Like, I think that, you know, anyone that spent any time with Hanzo or has seen Hanzo, like knows that he will, you know, you spend time with a sheik from Abu Dhabi and he would treat him as he treats the doorman from his building in New York. Like it's the same treatment because he treats everyone the same way. And, and, and I learned a lot from him about that. And I think that has influenced uh, a lot of the experiences and, 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 um, and things that I've been able to achieve through jujitsu. you know, just, uh, just more like, Hey, like, don't like try to impose yourself on people all the time. Like when it's time to compete, compete. But like when it's not time to compete, like, like we're all cool with each other. Like we're not enemies. Like we're not, you know, like we're, we're all part of the same tribe. Like let's help each other out, you know? And, and, and that goes even for people that don't train, you know? How, how much time did you spend with Hanzo? How, how long did you live with him? Yes, yeah, so when I first moved here, I think the first three to six months I lived with Hanzo. Then I, we went to open a school in Philadelphia. Uh, he had like a scumbag corner that was like taking money from him. So he had to, he had to like close that school down and he was going to separate from his partner. Like it was, you know, a whole, like it's a very long story. That'll take me like the whole, the whole podcast to tell you guys, I can tell you guys <laughs> one time outside. What? But then I, 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 you know, I started teaching in my own school, but three days a week, I would, I, but I lived very close to Hansel. So three days a week, I would ride the train with him to New York. Or I would ride in the car with him to New York. You know, all the trips to Japan and the trips to Abu Dhabi and training for those competitions together, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of time, man. It's so a lot. <laughs> do you, do you, like at that time, go back, go, go back with time, right? At that time, you live with him, you take train with him, you guys hang out, you, you guys have many, many, many conversations on different topics. You're obviously learning from him. Do you realize the magnitude of who Hanzo is? Today, many view him as a best of the best, one of the pioneers of what it is. Without him, especially jiu-jitsu on East Coast would probably be very different than what it is today. You spend time with him on a daily basis. It, do you realize like what the magnitude of the situation at that time? Or you just, you know, it's just hands on. Yeah, life is good. Peace. Listen, man, like, I, I don't know where you guys are located. I mean, I love the, I love the, the studio. It looks amazing. It makes me, <laughs> makes me look like, I don't know, uh, I should do something for both I always tell people if we turn the cameras around, <laughs> you can see what it really looks like. <laughs> you know, when I, I'm in New Jersey, man, you know what I mean? Like New Jersey, you know, there's very people that come from, I grew up in, you know, Rio. I used to live right on the beach. There's, you know, there is not, there's never been nothing here, you know, for me much more than jujitsu and the people that I met through jujitsu. And I only came here for Hanzo, you know, 
When I came to the United States, there wasn't many Brazilians here. And the other option would be to go to California. Mm -hmm. And there was, I guess, only the people that I knew of was the Machados um, and the Gracie Academy, you know, and they weren't like, I wasn't like affiliated with those guys. Or I didn't, didn't know anything about those guys. And Hansel was the, the guy from Gracie Baja, right? Like I grew up on the mats, like idolizing him. And we had a mutual friend and I had the opportunity to come here. And, and I was like, man, I can't believe I'm going to go to freaking, you know, New York sounded cool, but, you know, New Jersey and it's cold and, you know, have all these winters and, and, you know, it's, it's been my 25th winter and I'm ready to retire. But every winter <laughs> I've said that I was going to move in the spring since then. I've done it 25 times, but I was here for him, you know, and, 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 you know, my son's name's Hensel. Uh, you know, he, he gave me an opportunity and he gave, uh, he gave me a life and a perspective and, and a way to live. He didn't give me a life. He gave me like a way to live and a way to look at the world that I would have never had if it wasn't for his influence. And yeah, I knew, I knew, I knew in all the train rides and, and all the times that we were late for the airport and I was going crazy and he's always, you know, late everywhere. I, I knew doing all those rides that I was, you know, that I was in a very privileged, uh, I never lost sight of how privileged those moments were and, you know, how impactful they were going to be later to me in my life, for sure. Do you remember one story that comes to your mind like this? First thing that comes, one of the experiences that really made a huge impact on you? Man, there's, there's so I, many I can, crazy ones. I can't imagine so, so, there are so is many a good of story? Them. A good one or a bad one? <laughs> Whatever your favorite Entertaining one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. You're putting you on the spot here. <laughs> you're putting me on, you're, you're, you're definitely putting me on the spot, you know? So I'll tell you, I'll tell you one about, uh, Hans went high and his late brother, um, you know, high was always very, Hans went high were very close. Um, and high you know, as much as he loved Hans, he was always trying to beat him because he was his older brother, right? And Hoff was the mid brother, but high was the youngest. <laughs> And we had a trip that we went from Newark to Japan. Hands were fought in Japan. From Japan, we went to Abu Dhabi, and we competed in Abu Dhabi. And then from Abu Dhabi, we came back to Newark. So we went around the world in about, like, two weeks, so maybe a little over, a little bit less than two weeks. And we were together having every breakfast, lunch, dinner together. Like uh, Also, I think Luca from Gracie Magazine was there. But anyways, we, after this whole trip, you know, high and almost got in a fight with somebody in Japan. He almost got in a fight with somebody in Abu Dhabi. He was always almost getting in a fight with somebody. And we get in the car at the airport in New York and we're driving back to New Jersey. And high is like picking on hands with and picking on hands with, and, you know, like, and then, and then and I'm in the back and I'm like, man. So they start like screaming at each other. And I'm like, oh my God, like, what's going to happen? These two guys are going to fight. And the next thing you know, hands just looks over to his right. You know, high is in the passenger seat. He's like, you know what? That's it. So he slams the brake and you could hear the uh, Hansel had a suburban. So he just shoves the suburban on the shoves the suburban on the shoulder and they both jump out of the car. Hansel's like, that's it. Today you're gonna get your ass kicking. <laughs> so Hansel gets up and you know he goes over the, the front of the car and I'm in the back seat and the high end jumps out. And I see like both of them coming really close together. I was like, oh my god, like I don't know if I should get out of this car. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen. You know, what if they both get mad and just beat me up? <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, they meet sort of like in the front of the car like this. And Hyatt was very smart. And, you know, he, he had, you know, probably Hans was the person in the world that he most wanted to be like. And he had a lot of hands. And he just looks at hands like this. I'm sorry. I love you. You're my older <laughs> brother. You're right. Sometimes I can't even stand myself. So Hans just looks at him. And, you know, and they were like about to fight. And this is like on the shoulder coming out of JFK airport, you know, by the time I think the police was pulling up to the back and they just hugged and they got in the car and we drove back home to New Jersey. But that was kind of like, you know, that was kind of what our time was like together. You know, it was always somebody almost fighting each other. But right at the end. <laughs> That's awesome. Know, I love it. I love I, it. I can only imagine the amount of stories uh, and experiencing that you have buried deep inside your head um you know the untold stories maybe one day you should write a book and just list all of them man i'm just saying i just remember being so scared at that time you know like i was like yeah, and high, I'm gonna fight, and, uh, <laughs> on the sh 
on the shoulder, like, I'm going to get beat up and then I'm going to go to jail. You know, I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what's going on? And, and, and they just hugged and laughed. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> That's so I funny. wanted to ask you about your first uh, fight in pride. Is it true that you, you, when you went to Japan, you had no idea you were going to fight at all? Like it, and this is your first, so your first MMA fight is in yeah. pride and you had no idea it was going to happen. I don't know if you could tell that story a little bit, because I think that's, it's amazing to me. Oh, I was with high and, you know, I was just talking about him. When <laughs> high went, uh, high we are, we are not connecting the dots. Here. We are noticing a pattern here. <laughs> High end was to fight Sakuraba, right? I think at this time, uh, Sakuraba had beaten Hanzo. So High won a couple fights. So they wanted to do the match. So High was going to fight Sakuraba and he wanted to get to Japan early to get like acclimated to the time difference and stuff. And nobody wanted to go and spend two weeks in Japan, you know, because it was very boring. You just spend like two weeks in a hotel room and then you go train some tiny little, you know, training room at night. Like a lot of these enemy trips are like, you know, the, it's very monotonous, like the day to day, right? Like we just sort of like go train at night. So nobody wanted to go. He asked me, uh, he asked uh, Luca from Gracie Magazine, Luca Tala. And, you know, Hanzo was going to get there, you know, a couple of days before the fight, which is typically what we would do. If the fight was on a Saturday, we would get to Japan on maybe like a Monday or a Tuesday. And, you know, then we'd learn our lessons, start to get there a little earlier to get acclimated to the time difference. Ohio went to go, wanted to go like 12 days earlier or something. So we were for 12 days in Japan. We actually had a pretty cool opportunity. I don't know what Hickson was doing in Japan, but Hickson, Hickson came over to see Haiyan because he was there doing some promo for something he was doing. You know, Hickson at the time was huge in Japan. And Hickson offered to, you know, like train Haiyan or go train. So we had like a pretty cool training session with Hickson where basically he was just like, taking everything that we learned in jiu-jitsu and turning it upside down. And, and um, I don't know, man, you spend time with Hicks and you just get the, you know, I've been doing jiu-jitsu more than since I can't remember not doing jiu-jitsu. And I've seen a lot. And Hickson was probably like one of the few people that I've been around that you just get the feeling that he, he knows stuff that you're never going to figure out, you know, and not so much that you can't figure it out. It's just, you know, the way that he sees things. So it was a pretty incredible and powerful. Uh, session you know he super super nice guy very friendly and, and you know scary in a way but you know it was awesome it was amazing i, I learned in a one training session like some some things that i i carry with me with to this day technique wise and some of them just you know life lessons we were there for this and we were, we were doing the whole thing you know in the morning we just kind of walk around at night we train and then go to bed and wake up the next day do the same thing all over again there was a brazilian guy who was supposed to fight akira shoji and like three days before the fight, uh, I think it was Alan Goyes. I think Alan Goyes either got hurt or he had problem visa, uh, visa problems. And then, you know, we started, hey, man, this guy got hurt, you know, you know, let's, we're going to have to call somebody to fight him. I said, man, I'll do it. I'll fight him. You know? <laughs> it was like three days before. And then everybody looked at me like, what? What do you mean, Ricardo? Because I, I never really like wanted to fight, you know, like I just, I just always like competing, you know, I wanted to compete at the highest level and, and I was around it. And I was like, you know what? I think I could do this. Never done around the sparring, like nothing like that, you know. It was crazy. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But um, they called Hanzo, and you know, I said, like, Man, if you guys call Hanzo, and Hanzo says that it's okay, he approves and he thinks that I'm ready, I'll do it. So Hyan called Hanzo, and Hanzo, you know, they got the okay from Hanzo. And uh, yeah, three days later, I, I had like my first two 10 minute so, fights. I was like, So wait a minute, let, let, <laughs> let me get, doing? Let me get this straight, okay? So you fly into Japan, you, you hang out, go through these experiences, you, 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 you know, he's getting ready for the, for the fight. And you were like three days before the actual fight, you go like, eh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put gloves on for very first time. I'm going to jump into this ring. This is pride. I assume, right? Yeah. I'm doing jumping into the ring. Two ten minute rounds, man. Two ten minute rounds. I'm right. Not and I'm going to, I'm just, I'm just going <laughs> to give it a shot. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Life is good. What what is going through your mind like minutes before the match? Yeah, I want to know that. Like, like you, you are in a locker room, or you walking there. out? I, I is this sinking in even that you are about to do pride or 
like, are you in your own television here? Like, I'm trying to figure yeah, out what's was, going through your head. You know, when you're when you're 23, like, you think you're invincible, you know? Like, you think that, you know, or you, or even if you don't think you're invincible, you think that things are going to work out, you know? Like, you have, a, <laughs> you have, like, a hope in your heart and, like, an optimism that I think that when we're later on, we become a little more skeptical, right? Like, we learn our lessons that things are not that easy. But no, like, I, you know, the week after I decided that I was going to do it, I called my dad, I explained to him because my dad was always against fighting you know i explained to him what i, what, what I was gonna do and you know i think that like we talked a little bit like i had a, a, a an incredible sense of just sort of like responsibility right like i think back then like when you were fighting like in a way you were representing jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. i wasn't necessarily representing jiu-jitsu I, I was for sure in a way representing hens or right representing his school like the fights just weren't you know every weekend like they are now and i had like you know, I was pretty focused and I was pretty serious, you know, and but it wasn't until I walked out because it wasn't like we came from underneath. Like they brought us like all the way up to the top of the, the arena and we had to just kind of walk down the walk oh, down the, nice. the stairs, like all the way down to the octagon. And man, when I walked, when I got all the way up, like I looked and I saw like this little square, like all the way <laughs> at the bottom. I was like, oh, my God, I got to walk all the way down. And then it started to hit me a little bit. But then, you know, the fight started and it's fighting, you know, you just go, you just keep going and you try to win. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> for sure. Like after I was like, man, this was crazy. And in my first few UFC fights, I was like, man, like, this is nuts. You know, I was like, man, what, what am I doing here? Like, I got to get better. Like, I have to learn. I have to like, <laughs> be more professional. But in that fight, and, and I think in every fight, you know, you get nervous. To this day, I go compete in like, a, you know, the, the usually I do no Gi Pen Ms in New York Open, which they haven't had them in a long time. But, you know, as I'm about to have my first fight, I was like, man, what am I doing here? Why did I sign up for this? Should I just be home watching Netflix? Like, you go through all these things in your head. But as soon as you, as soon as you get going, then, all right, you, you're in and your, your instincts take over, you know? You mentioned just now it's all about getting better and using these experiences to improve ourselves, to continue growing and continue learning. And then probably 15, 15 minutes ago, probably more, you, you made a comment that I made a note. I want to go back to this. You said mm -hmm. the Euro Academy has changed the moment you became a father. Mm -hmm. I would love to know what was the Academy like prior to that and what was the Academy like after that, what is the change that events that's not related to jujitsu pivoted everything for you? I see a lot of uh, similarities here with me, so I'm, I want to. I'm curious what uh, what what that looked like on your side. So you know, as far as like that time, you know, we were in a racquetball court and. It was more like younger guys that we came and we trained and, and, you know, just going back to what we talked about, like how, you know, all of a sudden I'm fighting, you know, I, I had my first fight in the UFC and then like maybe three weeks later, I'm at Hensel's Academy in New York and I'm hitting the bag and Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta walk in. They had just bought the UFC and they are, you know, they want to sign people to fight for the UFC. They try to sign Hansel. Hansel's like, no, man, I have a contract with Pride. But I have these two young guys over here if you want to take them. <laughs> it was me and Matt Sarah. And two months later, I was fighting in Pride, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I was fighting in the first UFC. Two, two months later, I was fighting the first UFC. I did the ADCC 2001. And then like two weeks later, I did my first UFC fight. Another crazy idea anyways. Um, but, you know, it was probably like a year after that, I had my, my son a year and a half after that, I had my son. But, you know, I had a bunch of guys that wanted to be good at jiu-jitsu and that wanted to fight. And, you know, all of a sudden, I'm competing at the highest level. And, and I had to make my training partners. We didn't, didn't have, right, you know, a room to walk in with 20 black belts, right? Didn't even have, a, we didn't have world championships here in the United States at the time. Right, like back then it was in Brazil, yeah. so I couldn't compete. That uh, couldn't sort of like finish my geek career before I did the, uh, you know, ADCC and MMA. Since after I moved here, so I'm having all these guys and they all want to train. So it wasn't like a family friendly atmosphere, right? Like most guys were cool, cool dudes that like most people are. You know, they they look at the world and you know they want to 
they want to be okay and they want the people around them to be okay and they don't want to treat people like garbage but you know sometimes people don't want to be held to certain standards you know mm -hmm. so i think that when i decided that i want to have i want to i wanted to have a school that you know my kids could train i wanted to have a school that you know i didn't have to go get a job during the day and then come at night to teach like i wanted something that i could do full time right we had a friend one of the guys from hands was gene dunn we had like very successful karate schools. He was, as he was advising me at the time. And I started to look into certain things that, you know, they're easy to do, but they're also easy not to do. And then when you do them, they make a huge difference. You know, like, it's like, all right, now we're going to have a basic class, right? And we're going to have an advanced class. We're going to have a class for the beginners, right? So that in itself is already creates like a big step, right? We're going to have uniforms. Like we are going to have a time for people to show up to class. And if you show up late, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm going to yell at you. And then you start to hold people to certain standards and, you know, certain people left. And I remember when I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. I mean, when I decide to do something, I do it. You know what I mean? Like, especially if I have, usually when I decide to do something, I find a teacher. And if my teacher tells me to jump, I jump. Tells me to jump high, I jump higher. Until I get to a certain level that I think, all right, cool. Now I can maybe like ask questions, right? So Gene Don, who was a Hansel Gracie black belt later and karate guy, had very successful karate schools. Like, hey, Ricardo, how about you create a, you know, a basic class? How about you create a curriculum instead of just coming in and teaching, you know, off the top of your head? Like create a sort of like a curriculum. Have the students know what we're teaching that week and start having it like a more... Um, well thought out class structure that's not just guys beating each other up right like so once i started to have that you know basic classes the uniform you know a proper schedule with you know at certain times that people need to be there which now they seem like yeah of course you have a schedule back then yeah we had a play hey, guys we're gonna be here for and then some guys could show up at 4 30 some guys would show you know what i mean like i was there all day anyways to teach and yeah, you know, you teach an introductory class before someone jumps in, maybe in the group class, right? Or if you have a basic, like a fundamentals class, like someone comes in and tries their class, they try it in the fundamentals. They don't just come in and roll. And if they survive and they think that they want to come back, they'll make it back next time. Like this is 20 something years ago, you know, like I have uh, many, many. My first ADCC, I wore like real like surfing board shorts and a t-shirt. Like there was no rash guards. Like we didn't even used to wear rash guards. Um, you know, rash guard, the, the jiu-jitsu uniform comes from surfing. You know, it's not like even a real jiu-jitsu uniform. So I think a lot of things have, have changed. Not changed. I want to say they improved um, since then. And, uh, and that although for I'm grateful. Is that for good? Huh? Do you think that's for good? I think good? so, man. Yeah. I think so. You know, like I think that. You know, and, and again, this is just personal opinion. You know, people say, you know, the good old days and, you know, back in the time, you know, people are old school. And, and man, like, I think that just because something is changing and improving, we don't need to, we don't need to disrespect our roots and we don't need to lose our values. I think that everything that we do nowadays can be infused with history and can be infused with values and can be infused with best practices that have been passed down to us from the previous generations and you know, we can act with a certain with a certain reverence and respect for those people that have done it before us but it's up to us to 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 do it better than they did right because we 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 started way further ahead than they did and and mm -hmm. and my students are going to start way further ahead than I started that's yeah. for sure um so when i look at you know jiu jitsu as a whole and when i look at you know a lot of what's happening out there I love it, man. Like I, I, you know, to have like all these grappling competitions every weekend and, and to have, you know, the different rule sets, you know, IBJJFs and, you know, EBIs and, and ADCCs and, and, um, you know, sub only events every weekend, there's something going on and it, and it pushes the sport. And there's definitely the ability for people to sort of gravitate towards where they feel a little bit more attracted, you know, like, um, the only thing I don't like is when they push too much only competitive jiu-jitsu, right? Like, um, because not everyone can do that. Like, what, like some of the really good guys nowadays, they're not just great jiu-jitsu players. They're incredible athletes, right? Like, so it's sometimes it enters the levels of acrobatics a little bit. It's almost like these guys, 
did a few years of gymnastics and and uh and now they add jiu-jitsu to it right like I'm not lying, man. Like a lot of the a lot of the alliance guys came from freaking Capoeira. I mean, like Cobrino was a Capoeira guy. Like mm-hmm. a lot of these guys came from Capoeira. They're like crazy, incredible athletes. And then you ask someone who's you know never necessarily played a sport, um, maybe trains twice a week to do that sort of level of movement and intensity with the training. It's just it's it's, it's impossible. But that's right? that, like, that's I, why I, not every academy is good for everybody, right? Different academies yes. offer different things. Yes. Even though jujitsu is, yep. you know, is a good opportunity for everybody to engage, it's really important to for us to find a place that's fitting you, you as a student, especially in the very beginning. Wouldn't you agree? One hundred percent. You know, I think that you know, I'll give you the example of surfing, right? Like in surfing, not too many people know surfing, but it's kind of like kind of my thing before I even started jujitsu, right? We have the guys that longboard. And, you know, now you have big wave surfing. That was like the 100 foot wave documentary on HBO, which yeah. is pretty awesome. Like Garrett McNamara, right? Like you have, you know, you have girl surfing, like the girls surf amazing. They have all sorts, all sorts of, sort of like disciplines, like within surfing, right? But if you watch sometimes a surfing movie, all you're going to see is guys doing airs like it's the X game. But then when you go to the beach and you see people surfing, there's not a single person surfing like that. You know what I mean? Like, so I don't, necessarily appreciate to try to push into the into the recreational practitioner that their level or that their grappling needs to look exactly like Gordon Ryan's or 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 this guy because man like it's it's hard like it could do the yeah. exact same thing that Gordon Ryan does and it just turns out all wrong yeah. right like you know, or, or Gary or 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 you know Forgive me if I always mention like people that I'm I have a relationship because they're closer in my head, right? Like or or Cobrinha or the or the Mendes brothers, right? Like thank you. I can't move like that, right? Like so to a lot of times the the sort of images that we see on Instagram and stuff like that, it's all super, you know, I don't want to say fancy, but it's super athletic, where the majority majority of people that train jiu-jitsu and have a wonderful time with it and it really impacts their life in a way they just can't they just can't play that game right they just can't they just can't be at that level right they just can't move that way and that's okay but let's let's not make it not okay right like let's not make everyone to think that they have to move like that because like it creates like a weird sort of thing you know I don't, I don't like to be told that, you know, I have, I'm going to have to develop my style exactly this way because of this and this and this and this, right? Let's sort of all get good enough in the fundamentals so that we could bring our creativity and our own personality into our game, right? Like it becomes our craft. Like I, I, I love that aspect of jiu-jitsu, right? Coming up at Gracie Baja, we had like Holita who played like an upside down game with a helicopter sweep. We had soccer who had this game. We had, you know, we had all, all these guys that I grew up looking up to. And Master Carlos never imposed a sort of like cookie cutter style of jujitsu on anyone. He did impose the fundamentals, right? Like that was non-negotiable. But then all of us just sort of took it where we wanted to. Now, I'd love to see more of that. You know, people to be okay that they don't have leg locks like Gordon or that their wrestling is not like, like Nikki Rod, right? Like what they're, you know, it doesn't always have to be that way. Like, you know, we have a little bit more room for works or that I can't do rubber guard, like, like the 10 planet guys, like, you yep. know what I mean? Like, oh, I have to do a Lotus pose so that I could get a black belt. Well, here's my black belt. Cause I can't do that. Is right? that your job as an instructor to point people in that direction? Or do you let people figure that out on their own to say, you know, Hey, you're never, you're never going to be that way. Maybe you should look at, you know, old, older styles of jujitsu or, you know, smash passing or, you know, heavy pressure instead of, you know, trying to be like, like some of those people that are always on their back. Yeah. I try to, you know, I try to guide people, man, you know, like I, you know, in Portuguese, we said that if advice was good, we would sell it instead of giving it. You know what I mean? Like it's like a whole Portuguese saying. I try to like not give advice too much. You know, like uh, I, I've gotten better at you know uh, intervening at the right time and, and and more more speaking to the group and try to try to more um, not control but guide and direct the group into a level of thinking that perhaps they didn't have whether it was before class or before like a certain conversation that we had. 
more so than, hey, man, you got to do this, you got to do that. But yeah, you know, if, if someone comes and asks, I, I think that's a very valid question that not enough people ask. What is the, what should be my style? What is my game? Because when you look at your body type, you know, someone that is like a little bit more of like on the shorter side and it's flexible, bro, just go get all the Marcelo Garcia DVDs, right? Like if you're a little bit more lanky and long and flexible, you go get all the Braulio stuff and go watch him or just watch him, every one of his fights live, right? Like if you're, more, if you're a bigger, stronger, athletic guy that can move like a lightweight, go watch every one of Bushisha's fights, right? Like I think that you have to find in the icons of our sport someone that perhaps like your 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 body style suits them more and now even if we're older man like one of the coolest things is to see some of the amazing icons of our sport from the past competing like the you know the the master worlds like you see incredibly technical matches some incredible unbelievable performances that those can and should be emulated by you know, the, the sort of like weekend, us weekend warriors, they're not competing full time and they don't get talked about enough, right? Like, I think that um, when people ask, hey, you know, what's my style? Like, then just try to find someone that has a similar body type, moves similarly and just, just build on their game and then try to figure out where you take it, take it further, you know? And part of that is self-discovery too, right? This is where that purple belt time comes in where you know your basics you know the core of jiu-jitsu now it's time to figure it out what makes most sense for you for your body style we didn't even talk about how how we process information and there's another component people different people think different ways you know diff- yes. we learn differently some people re- you know do a thousand reps other people watch videos other people are more life uh, life engagement uh, you know learning process all that will dictate which direction our jiu-jitsu will go and how we adapt while all of this is unfolding. 100%, man. You know, like, I think that that's, you know, we talked a little bit about purple belt, but, like, I think that by the time you're a purple belt and for sure that belt, that, that purple belt transition to, to brown and black, right? brown belt is, I think brown belt is just to give enough time for the purple belt to get good enough to be black, right? It's mm-hmm. almost like a transition belt in a way. But, you know, it's someone to discover, like, their own style. Like, I think that mm-hmm. that's a big key thing that happens, uh, uh, you know, between purple and black. And then once you do that, that slow down of the process that I think distinguishes more, uh, like, the high-level brown belts from someone that maybe just got their purple, right? Like, their fundamentals may be the same. I just feel like the after three years... Uh, about to be black belts or recently graduated black belts are just able to do it in less steps. Yeah, no, absolutely. It does make sense. The, you know, all these changes are impactful to the students. And one of the big things that you've done at your academy is introducing kids program. And I know that is very successful, especially with, um, with your son. Do you mind sharing that story here? I know Gary wants to pick your brain on some things here. Um, you know, how, how did, jiu-jitsu change his life well my son was diagnosed in autism spectrum when he was five years old he was he was barely verbal man um you know very little eye contact he was really into you know video games and, and you know screens you know at the time the dvd players were around so you have like this little dvd player he watched the same same dvd all the time you know and we knew something was up and you know, like a lot of parents, we just think that our kids are going to grow out of it. And he wasn't necessarily growing out of it. And, uh, you know, we finally got him diagnosed when he was five. And they had IEP at school, like a, like an innovation or like an early innovation program. And right away, um, they started therapy, you know, like, and one of the first things they do uh, in applied behavior analysis, right? Like in the, in the way they work with kids in the spectrum, because the kids, uh, they do very well with the structure, right? And that's why I think jiu-jitsu is like a, such a, you know, martial arts in general, but jiu-jitsu is such a, so well positioned to help more kids in the spectrum because of the structure of our classes, right? Like it's a repetitive sort of thing. 
So the first thing that happened, and I noticed that from being, you know, I consider myself a, a, a teacher more than a fighter, right? For being a teacher, it's like, all right, they instituted the schedule. You had these little Velcro things, right? You know, first thing you're going to come to school and do the puzzles. And then you'll put the Velcro of the puzzles. And then they were going to do, I don't know, word games. And then, you know, we had like a whole schedule of what he was going to do every day. And that just sort of repeated itself. And he always looked to see what he had to do next, right? Because like, the kids in the kids in the spectrum, they tend to do not good with chaos, like when things are unorganized. Like anything that has a pattern or that it has a schedule, they thrive, right? So when my son was, I think, about eight, 10 years old, he asked to take class because I never put my kids in class until they ask. Like I feel that, you know, we talked about just being hard. Jiu-jitsu is hard. Like a lot of parents that put their kids in just they don't understand that you're basically you're basically getting your butt kicked every time you lose. And sometimes people are not ready for it, you know. And I think that you know you have to be vol- you have to volunteer to go to war versus be drafted. It's a very big difference, right? <laughs> um, so my son asked, and and then I was so nervous that I had to leave the building. I was like, man, what if you know if this guy is not going to like this? He's going to have a hard time. You know, maybe he'll get hurt and he'll never like it. I got so nervous that I left the school and I just kind of, I remember walking around the block and I had incredible instructors, uh, two black belts that, you know, now run their own schools, very successful, Pete McHugh and Dante Rivera, and they were watching Hanzo. And I just came later and asked how he did it. And I asked if he wanted to come back and he said yes. And he loved it, you know. So he always did very well because right away he memorized the warm up. So he knew that he was going to see all these kids. He was going to do the warm up. And then they were going to do a couple of techniques that he maybe had a little bit of a hard time. And where his struggle, of course, was with live training because it's so chaotic, right? Like, so, but little by little, and he struggled with the, with the touch. And, you know, in the beginning, it wasn't so easy for him. But, man, my son was never invited to a birthday party until, you know, maybe in high school, he was invited for like one birthday party. You know, like he's the, he's the kid with spectrum. Like he's the kid that, you know, probably all the other kids were embarrassed to have him around, you know? Um, and I understand that. And I don't resent the other kids, but he was never invited to another birthday party. He never made, he never participated in any other sports. Like he never had a chance to be a kid. Like all the kids, like nowadays, my daughter comes home from school. I have to take her phone away because if not, she's going to be texting like all her friends. I don't have to even bother my son because nobody wants to talk to him. You know what I mean? Which is, in a way, it's very sad, but it's true. And, and to be honest, if people are messaging, you don't even check the phone. You know, he couldn't care less. All he cares about is running and, and, and you know, his own, he's in his own world, you know. Um, but Jiu-Jitsu gave him the space for physical education, right? He gave him the space to develop his motor skills and uh, listening skills and coachability. Jiu-Jitsu gave him the opportunity to socialize where he didn't have before. Jiu-Jitsu gave him time away from the screen, which nowadays is such a key thing for all these kids. Where you go anywhere nowadays, like you can't even see a kid's eyes. Like the kids are like this. Mm-hmm. Like all the kids nowadays have like a hump on their back. Like they're freaking <laughs> like the hunchback in Norden. Because they spend all day like looking at their phones. You know, us yep. adults too, if we're not careful, we get like that. So Jiu-Jitsu gave him all these things. And Truthfully, it wasn't until later, uh, until high school, where he initially was in the math club. He did some bowling. He was in the singing club. Like the, you know, my my, my son was very lucky. I mean, he had the best teachers, but I only had like one time that I butted head with a teacher. I show up to a to a teacher parent teacher conference, and we were putting up together his schedule for the following year. And when I look at his schedule, he has like three chorus classes. I'm like, wait a minute. Why does my son have three singing classes? And this lady, oh, he's so he had this dude has perfect pitch. He could grab the piano and he could play anything. Any song he hears, he could start playing. And I'm like, okay, cool. He could play, but why does he have three singing classes? Put this boy to do math. He's good in math too. You know, he's good in what put him to do some science, you know. Maybe I was just being a little bit too intense. That was the only time that 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 I uh, that I butt heads. But his his math teacher sort of recruited him to the cross country team. And my son started running, man, and he fell in love. He fell in love with, you know, because it's times and then, you know, uh, it's very repetitive. And as soon as he started doing, he does long distance. Like, he's, he, he doesn't sprint very fast. Like, my daughter could always sprint faster than him. 
but the way that you become good at long distance running is just repetition and it's amount of time uh amount of time running it's mileage right like you start to slowly build and put more mileage and more mileage and more mileage and that he could do so he went from from never doing any sports outside of jiu-jitsu um second semester of his second year in high school he is he started running so a year and a half into high school he started running and he's finishing high school right now with a close to a full scholarship he's gonna study cybersecurity and run for division two school in florida which is a pretty high level school and you know the performance that he was able to get out of his body and you know his coach ability like i attribute a lot of it uh to jiu-jitsu you know like his 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 listening and his sort of respect for the coach and his his ability to to take directions and go go do it on his own right because that's it all right Hansel, you gotta go out run five miles at this pace and then at the end you have to do this and this and this like that skill to be able to do that especially when it's hard and you don't want to do it and it's 30 degrees out or it's 100 degrees out right like it's hard it's tough it's like jiu so it's not complex it's just freaking hard man because you could do it or you could not do it um but i really attribute his um uh, like the things that he's been able to achieve so far like in the classroom and outside to the time that he spent on the mats even though after he started running of course they train monday through saturday and he trains most sundays as well he pretty much runs seven days a week so he doesn't have time to be on the mats but uh, i attribute the a lot of the success he's had to starting jiu-jitsu early you know and my daughter the same thing you know she's she's not in the spectrum and she played soccer and you know her first uh, soccer practice like she was paying attention like all the other girls like chewing gum and looking at the sky and when the coach speaks she would listen you guys gotta go do this and then she'll go do it a lot like you know the the sort of methodology that we have in jiu-jitsu so you know especially with my kids i've become even more of a fan of jiu-jitsu for kids development alongside them going to school and even alongside other sports i think i consider jiu-jitsu to be essential like now more than ever and i consider jiu-jitsu to be the perfect tool for kids now more than ever whether they don't play any sports or they play and they want to come do jiu-jitsu in the off season like i really believe in it and i think it's awesome it's done wonderful wonders for my kids that's fantastic i, I do i do have to say that <clears throat> i really admire your positive attitude about <clears throat> about life and everything they the, the way how you project it, it it's just mind blowing to me a lot of people would view these situations as a complete negative or oh, this sucks this is hard this is impossible i have to do this blah 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 but you you really flip it to the other side like i don't have to look at the phone anymore that's not a problem i mean that's a good thing it sucks but it, it it's like you 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 pivot it in, in a, such a positive way that i found it as i was listening to you I found it um, very refreshing to most really don't view life that way. So my head goes off to you. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's phenomenal with all the success, obviously, that you, have, um, that you have experienced in your life. I think that could be one of the big, big positive things. So good for you. Before we finish, before we finish. Yes, sir. Thank we you. Have, um, we have this thing that we do at the end of every, every, every episode. Um, somebody who was sitting in your seat in a previous episode asked a question and they did not know that it's going to be you answering that question. So we have that question for you. Gary's going to take a lead on that. And I'm curious where, um, how, how that's going to go. Yeah. And Marcus Johnson, uh, gave us two of them and, uh, they're both kind of appropriate for today. So I'm, I've been trying this whole time. We've been talking to pick one. Uh, and I think I'm going to go with the second one that he gave us, which is what is the thing in your life that jujitsu has helped you with the most that is not jujitsu related? So personally, I think that, you know, jujitsu has helped me. It's given me a medium through which I interact with the world and sort of like it's in, you know once you do jiu-jitsu and you do it as long as we did you know it's impossible not to look at the world through the lens of jiu-jitsu right like like we have sort of like this we're a tribe right it's kind of like this tribal thing right but it's given me it's given me a view that you know at the same time it's given me the sort of like confidence 
and self-belief and sense of pride to try to do certain things. It's given me a, a huge sense of empathy towards other people, whether it's on the mats or off the mats, right? Because we just saw this with the pandemic, man, you know? We didn't see our students for however long, depending on where you were in the United States or in the world with these lockdowns. Like we didn't see people for a long time, right? And there wasn't a single person that didn't train like during the whole lockdown that was better off without jujitsu. Like I've never seen someone quit jujitsu and I meet them five years later or three years later or six months later in the, in the supermarket or, or, at a, um, or at a restaurant that they look better off without jujitsu in their lives. You know, they always look worse. You know, typically they look heavier. Um, you could see the sense of confidence and, and, and sort of like spunk is maybe going out of their eyes. Or sometimes they maybe they'd be embarrassed because so maybe they see you and, you know, you still try. I'm not going anywhere. I don't care. I'm training. I'm still training. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do anything else other than jujitsu. But I've had times that I trained one, times that I trained last, but it never really falters my passion for it however it's sort of like being dissipated at the time but yeah i have this huge sense of empathy towards people on the mats and off the mats and and um and i learned not to take things personal you know like it's um like you said you know like some of the things that have happened with my son and things that he's had to go through like i don't take it personal i i know you know probably like you know, those kids didn't want some kid who's going to cover his ears and scream when the music is too loud. And when he was younger, like, I don't, I don't take it personal. It's all right. You know, it's, we're not, we're not supposed to go with this world where everything okay with us all the time. You know, like I, 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 we all have within us. And if we look around, like we'll find people and the situations that will make things okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. Before we wrap this up officially and formally, where can um, listeners find you? If anybody wants to connect with you more directly, are you on social media, websites? Um, you know, I, we know you're on the East Coast, but can you talk a little, about, a little bit more about that? I'm on Instagram, man, but I'm not, like I'm not too much on there, like you know, all the time. But you know, Ricardo made it BJJ. You know, like mostly, you know, I'm, I'm at the academy. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk Anyone to you? Show that? up. <laughs> If anyone is ever in dirty Jersey, and I, I pity you, I don't know what you'd be doing here. I'm trying to get <laughs> out of here. But um, if you're ever in Jersey and, you know, you want to train some jujitsu, even if you're far from my school, I mean, you're welcome to come to my school, but a lot of my students have, like, amazing schools in the area. And, um, yeah, like, I'm around, you know, I'm around. Well, thanks for spending hour and 15 yeah, minutes with us quite a bit. I, I, we do appreciate, um, you know, the stories, the wisdom, your experiences. Um, you've contributed to jiu-jitsu community in general uh, quite a bit. You know, I find you one of the pioneers, the uh, generation two, if you will, after, after Hansel. So I do, I do appreciate um, everything that you've done for all of us, and I do appreciate you, or we appreciate I don't know. Gary, do you appreciate I absolutely do. <laughs> 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 thanks for thanks for being with be, be, oh, can, thanks for being here thanks for sharing your story and we will see you thanks so much right. guys thank you, thank you appreciate very much. everything thank you so much thank you for listening to raw radio if you enjoyed the show don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing for future episodes check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms take care mm-hmm.